Uh, thanks everyone for coming to, to our talk. Uh, we've got a very good uh, turnout, so I'm very pleased, Paul. Uh, this is actually the very first uh, Talisian's talk that's actually being live streamed on Meerkat on Twitter, so hoping a lot of people will see this worldwide as well. So I'd like to introduce uh, Matthew Dixon. So he's one of the co-founders of the Talisian's, and he's going to do a very, uh, well, I hope a very interesting talk, and I know it will be a very interesting talk on uh, financial modeling on parallel computers, essentially trying to speed up high-level code such as Python, uh, for uh, for mortals, basically. Please. Right. Thank you. Um, yeah. So thanks for coming. And you know, the caveat here is, you know, I'm I'm a quant by training. I'm I'm a mathematician. Um, um, I've been playing around with sort of programming languages. Um, I teach uh, a course um, at, on sort of machine learning, scalable machine learning, uh, in Silicon Valley. So we kind of turn out uh, a lot of um, sort of data data scientists who go on to sort of work at companies like Google and everything else. Um, and so I kind of spend my time working with um, a collaborator who's, at, uh, who's a, a, a GPU expert uh, at Old Dominion University uh, and also with Accelerate, uh, they're a high performance computing company. Uh, so what I'm telling, sharing you here today is really some experiences I've had and, and answering some of the questions which many people I think have been asking. You know, I want to use R, I want to use Python, how do I get the performance? Or I'm using C++, how can I avoid using going into a lower level programming environment? Um, I'm a mathematician by training or physicist, I'm not a computer scientist. I really don't want to be programming in OpenCL or, uh, or CUDA unless I really have to. Um, and I've, you know, um, back before I left for the States, I, I kind of got myself into uh, an interesting sort of uh, heated discussion, should we say, with the head of the quantity of infrastructure at Deutsche Bank, uh, and they were very opposed to using CUDA, um, very opposed to using, you know, let's wait for Lara B. Uh, that didn't happen, um, and there was sort of this sit, sit back approach. So I'm going to sort of give you a little bit of a running tour for those of you here um, who've got maybe some programming background but aren't maybe so familiar with what, what, what's happening in research in high performance computing. And uh, so I'll share some collaborative work with UC Berkeley that I've, I've done. Um, and then go on to share some examples. So again, um, for those of you who are pure programmers, um, I'll try and keep the math to a fairly low level, um, but at the same time, you know, this is sort of a quant finance area, so we do uh, tend to do sort of quite a bit of math. Um, so what I'm gonna really motivate here uh, in this talk is um, why financial modeling is such an interesting topic in itself. Um, you know, we just approach this through the lens of a programmer or developer. There's really a lot of unique things about financial modeling. Uh, which you, you don't see in other domains. Um, and in particular, I'm going to motivate the need for um, design pattern-based software frameworks. Uh, and look at some case studies using Python, R, C++, and we look at various different programming, uh, M MPI for Pi packages, we'll look at multi-processing uh, package in Python, and then we'll look at R and um, look and sort of show you basically what my sort of findings were there, um, how I created a CRAN um, package which did a lot of the offloading onto GPUs for some of the compute intensive routines. And then I'll talk a little bit about the work I've been doing um, with Accelerate on um, writing one, one C++, C++ code and having that deployed on a GPU and also on a multi-core CPU. So um, we're very fortunate um, to have in the back today uh, Robert Jeeva, who's, um, uh, who's, uh, who's really an expert in the area of, um, of the Intel Xeon uh, fee and the Intel Xeon um, ar architecture. Um, and so. Um, I'm very much hoping that the sort of the culmination of this talk will be on sort of the next steps. You know, would people be interested in, say, a quant lib, uh, which you could deploy on a parallel architecture? And so, um, you know, my goal is to try and uh, create or work with, you know, with, with quants, with quant lib enthusiasts to create a parallel version of quant lib. And uh, I'm going to show you why I think that that's a great idea. So, um, you know, this isn't a pie in the sky research talk. I really want something to come out of this. And, and I think that a parallel version of Quantlib would be useful. Just to recap, um, you know, so the goal of this talk is really uh, about design space exploration um, and, and why that's important in financial modeling. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the various examples you've been looking at um, and, and why uh, I think you know, uh, design patterns are important. Uh, this work has been published over the last four to five years. Um, so you can find all the references to conference papers, journal papers, uh, which so all the details of the implementations, any source code that's in this talk will be um, accessible in there. I, I'm an academic, so I actually run uh, the High Performance Computational Finance Workshop at Supercomputing every year, which is the only computational finance um, 
workshop in the supercomputing area. It's funny, you know, um, in the supercomputing community, they're completely oblivious to finance. They've got no idea. Um, so I'm, we're one of the very few people that are pushing for computational finance in supercomputing. It's just not on the, the radar screen at all. Um, and, and so, you know, we think it's interesting to merge these different communities and get different ideas and transfer ideas across communities. And uh, also, we think it's you know interesting to develop software that um, you know can be used um, by quants uh, as an example. So, um, and you know, I think it's I think you know, it's good to to sort of share these ideas across different communities. Um, there's very much a machine learning community in San Francisco, clearly with all the uh, Silicon Valley companies. Uh, and so that you know, um, computational finance doesn't really sort of exist very much in Silicon Valley. Um, and it's very interesting, sort of, you know, when you give a talk like this in San Francisco, um, it's a very different type of uh, environment. And, and they're really not uh, aware of the many issues that there are, you know, in banking. So I think there's a big disconnect between Silicon Valley uh, and London and New York. And, and I think, you know, uh, there's a very different way of thinking. That's a very different way of training. And to the extent which we can make, um, you know, publish is a very important area. So the Moore's Law is dead, um, you know. Doubling um, the number of transition transistors every 18 months um, creates unsustainable heat dissipation. So we've moved away from obviously the serial processor, um, and you know, I think you know we've sort of reached this point where um, everyone is sort of on the same page that we need we need parallel processing capabilities. Um, you know, I think uh, you know it sort of five years ago that it wasn't apparent. I think people were sort of holding on for Moore's law. Uh, clearly, that's that's sort of a, a dinosaur now. Um, and I think we have to understand that there's now a variety of different hardware out there, a myriad of hardware. Uh, there's multi-core CPUs, there's CPU, GPU. Uh, we have, you know, clusters, private clusters, public clusters. You know, in Silicon Valley, you know, uh, there is such a vast array of, of hardware, low-cost commodity hardware which being used, obviously, obviously in banks as well. Uh, we have compute farms uh, for, you know, contingency um, measures to meet, you know, ISO 9001 standards, etc. Um, and what we do have is, you know, we have FPGAs, um, you know, we have IBM's own offering of accelerator cards. Um, and so given this myriad of hardware um, and given, you know, developments in mi parallel microprocessors, you know, one of the challenges we're seeing is that there's a gap. Um, and, you know, if you're a physicist or a mathematician, you know, next to nothing about parallel programming. Um, you know, you care about doing modeling, pricing derivatives. You care about, um, you know, reporting risk. We care about calculating economic capital or doing financial econometrics, doing machine learning, but you're not a systems programmer who understands maybe you know the low-level parallel architecture concerns. And so one of the challenges we've seen is that it's very difficult for someone who's trained as a quant, uh, you know, front office quant or a risk manager quant. I don't know how many of you here are, are quants in front office or in risk management applications, but to certainly drop into a low-level programming environment without having some, you know. Um, proper training in the area of parallel programming and scientific computing. Um, I happen to sort of, you know, I try to sort of navigate the, the sort of painfully the two. Um, I, I'm, I, you know, I'm sort of enthusiastic in this area. There are some heroes in the space that, that do this, um, that, you know, uh, there was a, a, a developer at Bloomberg who was really one of the first people to adopt GPUs at Bloomberg and built up their GPU compute farm for their asset-backed mortgage and mortgage-backed securities. Um, so they could do that all and pull that. Um, and you know, there have been many, many examples of hero programmers who've made the conversion uh, within, you know, within the banks over to GPUs and, and specialist architectures. In the case of Bloomberg, they were already using things like MPI, so it wasn't such a quantum leap. Uh, BNB Paribas, of course, has a specialist HPC group. Um, so there's varying degrees of sophistication. But let's face it, I mean, you know, I'd say, what, 1% of quants know how to program in CUDA? Probably less. You know, if you Google on go on Indeed, go on Monster.com, go on any job site. You know, how, how often in the job adverts do they say must know how to program in CUDA? I mean, I, you know, it's pretty pretty low. Um, I've not seen that 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 much. Same with OpenMP. It's a specialist area. Most of the clients, you know, are coming in uh, with you know a master's degree in mathematical finance, for example. Um, and so, you know, you don't get taught how to power program in, in most math finance programs. Uh, or even computational finance programs in the U.S. Um, so you know, it's um, so the challenge is how do you bridge this gap? 
And, you know, to the point, um, for those of you who are programmers and, and, you know, haven't sort of played around too much, you know, the, the, the point of this slide is to really emphasize that there's a myriad of, um, of financial models. Even if you take, for example, um, volatility models, there's constant sort of innovation and modification and, you know, proposal by academics and by researchers and by quants to constantly sort of push the bar and find new models. And so, you know, sitting back with Heston um, is very limited for, for, say, for FX, where there are, you know, jumps or for modeling commodity futures. You want to use maybe jumps. Maybe you want to use some sort of levy process. Um, but certainly, I think you know, we need to create, we need to have a programming environment which is very flexible. It's very easy to adapt the models. This is what is called design space exploration. As soon as you start loading up your code with parallel programming primitives and you start having to write a low-level programming environment, it's very, you lose some of the programming flexibility and expressibility, which is important for financial modeling. I think one of the reasons why people like MATLAB or they like R or they like Python is it's very easy to code up models very quickly. Um, it's harder to do that in some in other languages. And so, you know, one of the nice things to do is to be able to experiment and see which model fits best, calibrate the model, etc. Um, and, you know, sometimes some of these models are very compute intensive to fit robustly, as I will talk about in this, uh, in this presentation. Um, so a lot of this work is really motivated by, coming from Intel, ironically, um, by, by joint work with Tim Matson and Kurt Kutzer. Kurt Kutzer was a, former, a collaborator of mine uh, when I first started looking at this uh, about five years ago. Uh, he's at uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, he was one of the co-PIs on the... Uh, on the Par Lab, which was funded by Microsoft and Intel, and they made sort of transformative sort of leaps in terms of application-focused parallel computing research. And Tim Matson's a principal engineer, uh, very um, applied, and together they worked on um, the idea of, of design patterns for parallel computing. Uh, this came out some years ago, and there have been a number of developments in this direction, um, uh, in particular with a PhD student, a um, recent PhD student, uh, and they have developed you know, the idea and they've sort of actually turned it into a software framework called PyCASP. Um, I mentioned this, I think, uh, before, but you can go and, and look at that. Um, that sort of goes beyond the scope of what I want to talk about today, but the idea is um, very much in, you know, in line with, with the, the sort of the, the concepts of, um, of and their, their vision of the research, which is how do you bridge the implementation gap? So rather than trying to find a quick fix, you know, you've written some code and you want to find a point-wise solution to accelerate your kernel, what about the malice of forethought? Thinking ahead, designing something, having parallel architecture um, in mind, rather than just trying to sort of speed up one particular kernel which is slow and forever playing catch-up and forever getting tied to a particular hardware vendor and just, you know, feeling like you're constantly ordering pizzas all the time, um, rather than sort of, you know, the forethought of designing something that really scales. Uh, across, you know, a large, uh, a large investment bank. So, in, so this requires some parallel architecture skills to be thinking about how to deploy some of the most common kernels. And this, so this talk is really about factoring out and crystallizing a lot of what's done in in quant finance and trying to identify what are the bottlenecks and how can we um, overcome those and still use high-level programming uh, languages without without us needing to write models in low-level programming languages. And so, I don't know how much you can read this at the back, I know the, the font's getting a little small there, um, I'll share the slides. But the, but the basic sort of idea behind Kurt Kutzer and Tim Matson's work, um, uh, and they coined this, um, what they call our pattern language, um, which is somewhat sort of megalomaniac, but uh, mm -hmm. I, I like it. Um, uh, and really critically, um, there is the concept here of computational patterns, structural patterns, uh, and then there are parallel algorithm strategy patterns, implementation strategy patterns. I'll go a little, a little bit into that, but the main idea is that you can factor out across any application area, whether it's in science, medicine, um, you know, physics. But within finance, you'll tend to find that most of your computational bottlenecks fall into these particular categories, whether it's structure grids like finite elements or finite difference methods for you know, pricing exotic derivatives, uh, whether it's using sparse linear algebra or dense linear algebra um, for solving, you know, these finite difference uh, methods. Could be some sort of dynamical programming algorithm, like an optimization technique. Could be a tree type of method, you know, whether it's, uh, uh, it could be simulation, could be FFT or spectral type methods. But generally, you can 
identify any kind of any class of application, and the key thing is to factor out what are the computational patterns. So first of all, you know, we identify those computational patterns in any application, and I'm going to walk through an example and show how that's done. And then there are structural patterns. This describes how the algorithm itself is mapped to how to the architecture. This is somewhat separate from the, the world of, of algorithmic science or algorithmic or computational finance. We tend to think of that in algorithms, um, but then there is a whole layer of logic around how do we map the, the algorithm itself efficiently to the architecture. This matters because some algorithms may be very efficient in serial, but not map well to certain types of architecture. So there's a, there's a, a sort of a, an intense um, coupling, or, it's, or rather it would be very unnatural to decouple these, these computational patterns from the structural patterns. One of the most common ones is the map and reduce. Of course, Google have their map reduce um, in, own implementation, which is facilitated Hadoop, et cetera, and the whole um, uh, sort of distributed database um, uh, movement. But, but MapReduce is one example. Um, we'll see that in, in, this, um, in this particular presentation. But then there is model view controller. There is iterative refinement. Um, there are many types of structural patterns which describe how the, um, the algorithms themselves are mapped to the, to the architecture. So these are of primary concern to, soft, to parallel software architects uh, who are looking to gain efficiency in the application. Whereas the computational patterns may be more familiar to a quant developer, someone you know, who's uh, got a math background, um, but uh, is maybe not a computer scientist. Um, and then there are certainly many more layers of, of complexity there in terms of you know, the type of parallelism, whether it's fork join or it's, it's uh, single program, multiple data, etc. Um, you know, those, those details are somewhat superfluous here. But um, I think what's interesting here, you know, if we stand back for a moment, um, all I'm trying to do, in, in, and all they try to do, and I'm certainly not claiming any credit here, is sort of to get everyone on the same page. I think it's very easy to get fractured thinking in, and, and sort of seduced by, or certain sort of, very easy to get sort of stuck in one particular way of looking at the world. Uh, and that's certainly what's happened. Um, and when one, one vendor approaches you, another vendor approaches you, you get these very different ways of thinking about things. And it's very nice to somehow bring it back and conceptually or abstract out um, and find a sort of a common language which enables everyone, whether it's quant developers or quants or system architects, vendors, you know, academic researchers and computer science, to somehow have a shared vocabulary or ontology uh, and they're able to define some sort of scope. Um, and also to, to be able to um, really achieve modularity and comprehensive coverage of the application domain and so, you know, one of the goals of using our pattern language is really sort of to try and bring everyone on the same page um, in terms of um, using a common language. And it's, you know, it's not rocket science. So, I mean, I think, you know, it, compared to, you know, solving PDs and things, it's, it's a pretty simple um, conceptual um, uh, sort of development. So that's our pattern language. And then let's take us a step forward now into the realm of financial applications. So, so far, I've talked about computational patterns. Those tend to be the bottlenecks, the things that take a long time. Uh, you know, that could be, for example, FFT, could be doing a finite difference solve. Um, but then we have application patterns. And really, if you look across all the finance, whether it's in investment banking, whether it's hedge funds, machine learning, for example, for algo trading, um, you know, whether it's portfolio management, you're doing some kind of optimization, uh, you know, whether you're in asset management or risk management, there are really, you know, a subset, and I think it, you know, remains to be sort of um, fully sort of crafted yet, but there is this sort of systems view of finance, which separates out what are the application patterns for, say, derivative modeling. Well, we know that calibration of derivatives is an important application. Uh, we know that that has to be done um, in order to ensure that the derivatives prices themselves uh, carry little model risk. Then we have things like PDE methods. We have stochastic differential equations, for example, RESTE methods. How do we parameterize those models under risk-neutral measures? Well, we would use some kind of calibration of an option, um, option chain, for example, which I will describe. Then we have binomial trees. These are applications, and then we just determine what are the computational patterns behind those, those particular applications. So in this case, you know, calibration, um, there is going to be some kind of dynamic programming problem. Um, in, in spectral methods, for example, um, you know, we would have 
or it could have a, a characteristic function, usually requiring some kind of spectral method, whether it's FFT. If it's sparse linear algebra, you know, then um, you know, or it's PCA, for example, or it's some sort of vector auto regression, um, then you know, we're going to have some kind of dense linear algebra routine behind it. And so again, it's the mapping from applications to the computational patterns, which is not really sort of laid out in any systematic way. I think you know, I think everyone sort of knows it in their heads, but it hasn't really been sort of really laid out in a way that's more like a blueprint. Um, for how sort of financial modeling works and how if you were to build your idealized quant finance stack, um, you know, uh, how, how you could essentially classify and have core components um, separated out. So by doing this, we're in a way reducing a, a, already a lot of redundancy. We're seeing that, well, if I have a PCA, I maybe have a GARCH if I'm doing time series analysis, if I'm doing vector water regression, and I'm using the same underlying dense linear algebra, maybe I could use this one library behind that. And then I only need to focus on speeding up that one library. And then all my work needs to be in just mapping that out that particular computational pattern efficiently to the underlying architecture. Rather than having lots of disparate applications and then trying to sort of you know, quickly speed them up and ending up with a house of cards and having a lot of redundancy, a lot of rep, rep, um, repl replication in the code, so the idea is really to factor out at this level what are the common components behind many of these applications. And, um, and I just will say as well, of course, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a need to parallelize these particular computational patterns. It highly depends on the, the parameter. It may not be a computationally complex problem. It may be a trivial type of problem. And so really, you know, the parameterizations of these applications are also critical. And I think that was one of the problems with the adoptions of GPUs. People got their NVIDIA cards, they, they set out to program them, and they didn't get the scalability. And you know, the problem wasn't really big enough to get out of bed for. Um, and that was another problem that we saw with the adoption, I think, of GPUs in certain cases. People just weren't pushing enough workload through. So the parameterization as well of these applications matters, and I haven't, you know, I've kind of glossed over that here. But that's certainly something that um, needs to be sort of detailed. So the goal then um, is to provide a library, and I think it may be the best place to start with consensus you know, from, from the community, everyone, is you know, where to start. But I think you know, possibly taking Quantlib and trying to apply this pattern-based approach um, and then seeing how that can, can work you know, in terms of scalability on different parallel architectures. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about you know, using Python, R, C++. I'm not going to go into the nuances of every single possible way that you can parallelize in R and Python. You know, there are many different competing technologies. I will say in passing a few which I've had a look at and I like. I'm sure many of you here have played around with that as well. Um, and I think, you know, for me personally, you know, there's a lot of money invested in legacy code, um, being practical to the extent to which we can reuse legacy code rather than having to rewrite it is, is a major, you know, obviously is a major um, in, uh, sort of incentive. Or, or a major sort of attractive point. And I think it's a very inefficient work structure right now when you have a quant coding in MATLAB and then they hand that over to an IT group and then the IT group completely recodes it from, from the very beginning again um, and then tries to match the numbers of MATLAB and realizes you've got different random number generators and there's reasons, various reasons why they don't match and at some point someone waves their hands and says, okay, this goes into production. And I think that's not a very efficient way of working at all and I've experienced that myself uh, and I wouldn't want to do that again. Um, so that's um, that's the sort of, if you like, the, the sort of conceptual part of, of the parallel, uh, parallel architecture part. Now we're going to switch over to a case study um, and we're going to switch gears and sort of be quants for a second. Um, and so just park that for a moment while we think about stochastic volatility. Um, and that's an application which I'm now going to demonstrate I think it's a very interesting application which, because it illustrates many of the points in this talk. Um, and, you know, I'm primarily interested in sort of in, in, um, in, in research, in sort of finance, and, you know, I like to find codes and things which will accelerate uh, different models. And it's kind of interesting to note that, you know, in high frequency data, there's been a recent paper which has observed the leverage effect. There's, um, you know, I'll note in passing that the leverage effect is... It's quite a case, because I'm looking at that from a modeling perspective. <laughs> interesting, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's interesting because it, I think that, you know, that there's this whole sort of puzzle around it, you know. Um, is, is, is it, you know, just, obviously correlation doesn't 
imply causation. Um, you know, people had, you know, the, the theory had been, or the conjecture had been that, well, you know, when the stock price goes down, the debt to equity ratio increases, and, and that's why, you know, the volatility goes up, etc. Um, but then, you know, there have been counter, counterpoints where the debt to equity ratio has gone up, but they've not seen the corresponding effect in the change in volatility. So, um, so there's still a, there is a conundrum here. It's interesting, um, you know, I, I kind of find, find this sort of, um, sort of the, the empirical aspects of finance, which is ultimately what, what everyone's trying to do here with the data, um, very interesting. And, um, you know, most front offices will build up their stochastic volatility models. They'll pick their favorite stochastic volatility model. We could spend a whole you know, hour just talking about the various different stochastic volatility models as people have done to death. Um, it's a fascinating topic. Um, much remains to be done on it. Um, and as mathematicians, we could spend a lot of time talking about um, you know, how you actually formulate the, 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 the risk-neutral pricing. But here today, I'm only going to pass over this as, as sort of more as a systems person. And, and looking at this case study, I'm saying, well, I like flexibility here. Um, I sort of don't really care what this is. It's just a black box, but there's a computationally complex um, component here. Um, and then I need to build up the volatility surface, and then I'm going to do something with that volatility surface, like maybe I'm going to price some exotics off it and quote those as a market maker, um, or maybe I'm going to interpolate the surface and quote in a, in a particular strike maturity pair, which currently isn't, uh, is, is, is not currently quoted. So there are many, you know, this is obviously a, a highly... Um, a, highly relevant usage case, uh, if I'll use that terminology. Um, and so, given that this is an important case, you know, case study, um, it's interesting to, to, to answer when you can um, start accelerating these codes, start saying, well, if I, can, if I can accelerate my code and recalibrate something which would have taken maybe half an hour to, to calibrate, if I, if I use certain types of calibration routines and I don't make shortcuts, I'll explain all that in a moment. What happens if I recalibrate to, say, high-frequency data or mid-high-frequency data, so 30-second snapshots, um, and, and this is the, the red line here. That's the error on the y-axis. These are 30-second snapshots. This is just looking at one single-name equity option, Zynga. And it's kind of interesting because, you know, I, I like to think, well, now that I've got the speed and the compute power, I can do things faster. You know, so faster is better. Well, faster doesn't necessarily mean better. It actually opens up some new questions. So right now, what I'm, what I'm exhibiting is a black line where I calibrate at time zero, and then, you know, I could have left it and with stale parameters, and I get this model error appearing. But if you'll note, it's not quite as volatile as the red line, because I'm calibrating every 30 seconds. I now have a, a bias variance trade-off to make. So I can calibrate faster, but then I've now got parameters which move around more. So I've reduced my error, but now I've got higher variance. So there's all sorts of you know, interesting questions which arise. Again, I'm giving this more as a sort of a side note that when I did actually speed up the code and ran everything, I started calibrating much more frequently, but then I ran into some, some new questions. Um, so that was just a, a passing thought here. So skipping over the model itself, um, and again, I'm actually numerical analysis by training figured out how to use a better method than FFT. So many of you will be familiar with um, Carl Madan FFT formulation for option pricing in their 1991 paper. The problem with the Carl Madan approach for, for using FFT is it requires a damping parameter. That damping parameter is essentially um, regularizing the, the integral and the characteristic function to avoid a, a Gibbs phenomenon type of effect. So what Keyes Oosterly and his PhD student did, um, it, who now I think works at ING Bank, is they came up with a, a formulation of the integral which does not require a damping parameter. It actually expands the entire integral rather than the integrand. And so even if you have near singularities, L1 or L2 singularities, it still remains robust and you don't need to add any damping. And the very nice thing about this algorithm, not only is, is I'll show you, it's, it, well, the, if this is, this is the, the regular, um, uh, uh, th so this is an FFT method. This is showing you the error, and this is showing you the number of, um, of for a cosine terms, or the number of, uh, you know, I'm, I'm comparing it with quadrature as well. But the convergence rate of this new algorithm I showed you, which was proposed by Keyes um, Usterly, uh, he's at uh, 
he's in, he's in Holland, and um, he's written a lot of papers in this area. It's much faster. And so um, it's much better regularized than the Karmadan FFT method. So we're going to use that. It's, it's a much better algorithm than, than what you would find in, say, using the CUDA FFT. Converges much faster. Um, and in this problem as well, um, typically, you know, many of these option pricing type models um, require global calibration. So it's a global optimization problem. But what that means is that your starting conditions, or your rather your solution, is very contingent on your starting conditions. And so to the extent that you want to minimize the dependency of, the, of, your, of your converged result on your initial conditions, uh, it's good to use some sort of global optimization. So one technique is differential evolution. This is very computationally complex, um, which is another reason why I'm talking about it in this case study. Um, and then we combine it with some kind of local optimizer. So I'm trying to look at this picture as a whole. You know, I'm looking at a problem. I, it's a little bit atypical to working you know, in, a, in a bank where usually a quant gives you the code. They've already figured this stuff out, and you parallelize it. I'm actually trying to sort of look at the whole thing and say, OK, what's, what's the best approach in each case? Don't want to use FT. I can replace that. So it's somewhat you know, of a luxury here to be able to do that. Um, but you know, this approach has been, you know, I think, in existence for some time now. It's, it appeared in the Walmart magazine uh, a few years back. Um, you know, people say to me, well, why do you use, you know, you keep talking about Python and R, and you haven't mentioned Scala, and you haven't mentioned Julia. You know, what's, why, what's your fascination with Python and R? Um, and I get this question asked a lot in Silicon Valley. Um, there's a lot of you know programming evangelists there, um, and you know they, they sort of snub at me when I sort of mention the word Python and R. And they're, they're they're very into sort of Scala, and I think well, you know there are many packages right now. The, the I'd say the maturity of the quant infrastructure in these languages, in addition to C++, of course, uh, you know you will find excellent you know um, libraries for say machine learning or for you know, global optimization written in R and Python that just aren't there right now in Scala. And it's not, it's not cost effective to have to write you know, um, an entire machine learning type library or even an entire nonlinear optimization package of all the constraints uh, and import it over, unless, of course, you know, you're using some kind of mixed language um, implementation. So a reason why I stick with Python and R here is I think that many people use it in the quant finance industry. Um, obviously, you know, C++ being still very much the, the standard, um, and I'm not sort of not doing justice to Java here either, but I'm just saying that there are a lot of um, you know, numerical programming packages already implemented in these languages, which are actually open source as well, which um, is kind of handy when you're playing around with, with this. So the remainder of the talk, I'm going to now just sort of walk through, um, first of all, I've walked through three examples. So you've seen the, the problem I'm trying to solve. I'm trying to calibrate a stochastic volatility model. I'm trying to use differential evolution to avoid um, the dependency to the initial condition, the initial choice of parameters. Um, I'm trying to be model agnostic because I think that you know here the goal is to try and um, integrate a package um, or a library which can handle any kind of model. And I'm going to walk you through first of all what, what we did with Python. And so to avoid the you know Python is inherently single-threaded. It has a global uh, inter, uh, interlock, um, and so to bypass the um, the, the global interlock, um, what we did is we used the multi-processing package that, um, for shared memory parallelism, and uh, we, we launched uh, you know, NP processes on a single multi-core CPU, uh, and then we if we have n options in our chain, then we assign n over NP uh, optional model computations to each process. Um, and then we also looked at distributed memory programming as well. So we had a cluster um, of shared memory. So we had a cluster of, of dual core Xeons. And we tried using the MPI, MPI for Pi package. And then what we did was we, we run a chunk of N over MP optional model computations on each of uh, each MPI process. So I'm going to show you the results of that um, and show you essentially using somewhat standard notation so I have a chain of options. The option chain could be as large as 1,024, say for something like Apple, or maybe even 2,000. Uh, it very much depends on the, the, the number of options that are quoted in the market and, and, and the and liquidity of those options. So it depends you know, how, many, how many data points you want to use in your, your option chain to build up the surface. But then you know, you'd have your strike maturity, um, and then obviously the quoted market price. 
So simplistically, all I'm trying to do is a least squares error um, by fitting the, the model itself, denoted by the price here, um, set of parameters for the model, whether it's a Hester model or a Bates model, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a levy process, whatever the model is, underlying forecasting model is, it, it, it will give me um, a risk neutral price, and then I want to fit that um, and compute the error and minimize that error. So this is one step of that objective function, or well, this is the objective function that I'm trying to minimize uh, with my nonlinear programming model. Um, and, you know, so that's essentially all I want to do is I want to parallelize this, this, this algorithm. Um, and so the first parallel algorithm that I tried was just using this, um, you know, this shared memory um, multiprocessing package where you construct a pool of uh, processes and then um, those uh, launch a synchronously um, and the pricing functions uh, and then you, you essentially scatter and gather the results uh, and compute what the root mean squared error is at, at the end of it. Um, so that's parallel algorithm one um, and I'm going to benchmark this and then two is the MPI version. So we're comparing shared memory um, and the distributed memory we actually tried a hybrid version where we tried distributed memory and shared memory on a cluster, um, and that, that didn't actually work as well. So in the MPI version, um, you know, we, we, we set up our, um, the MPI uh, cluster, so we essentially distribute a chunk of, um, of options um, and, and, and provide the data to those options, to so the strikes um, and the maturities that they're needed. Uh, and then in each MPI process, we compute the result and then we use an all reduce MPI function to, to bring back the result, and then finally do the, the square root computation. So um, both, you know, one's taking one of the shared memory on each processor, one's using MPI within Python, and um, these are the performance results. So um, again, this is using, so this is on a 32 dual socket Dell PowerEdge um, with, with Intel Xeon uh, processors, four cores in each processor, I think I said two, so sorry, it's four cores. And so um, the size here denotes um, the number of, uh, essentially the number of um, uh, options in the chain. So uh, I think we use Apple here and we went up to 1,024 because there, there are many more liquid options than that that were quoted in this particular snapshot. And the, you can see here the comparison, um, the hybrid is actually the combination of the two. I didn't say anything about that. I think the results aren't so impressive. So if we just focus on the, the, the third and the fourth column, we have the shared memory algorithm, this is parallel algorithm one, um, and there what we've done is, because we have dual sockets, uh, four, you know, so there's eight cores in each node, um, we have run that algorithm, and obviously as you increase the, the load, you'll see better parallel efficiency, that's the noted in parentheses there, the speed up relative to the sequential version. And clearly, if we're taking advantage of the entire cluster, assuming that you've got a dedicated cluster, which is you know, uh, very, uh, <laughs> very presumptuous, um, then uh, you can obviously get much, much higher um, uh, speed ups. So this is an algorithm which scales, scales pretty well, um, and you know, we're able to reduce um, you know, a, a computation which would have taken around 2.7 seconds to around about just under 20 milliseconds. Um, just by using the MPI package and the MPI for Pi package. Uh, so the, the key thing there was really to have sufficient workload uh, in order to, or sufficient levels of parallelism uh, in order to, 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 for this algorithm uh, to, to deliver the kind of speed ups. Um, and so, you know, for the smaller option chains, it's, you know, probably less, uh, it's less motivation to, to do this. And of course, that's just one step. Um, of the optimizer, and then we applied various different types of nonlinear optimizers. Uh, and again, showing the number of options in the chain, um, you know, I picked uh, it's a powers of two for, for convenience. Um, and here we see again uh, the overall time in seconds. And you know, what we note um, is that you know the it's really because the the error function is a bottleneck in these in these calibration methods. It's the FFT, which is creating, well, the, the, the Fourier cosine method, which is creating the workload. Um, we see, you know, that essentially um, similar scalability in the overall algorithm. Although, uh, interestingly, the performance of the algorithms can be very, very sensitive to Randolph error, especially when you need to compute derivatives in the optimizer. 
um, any kind of RAML error and, and the ordering of the computations on the parallel nodes can affect the convergence results. So you could see uh, much more sensitivity to, um, in terms of the number of, total number of iterations in things like trunc truncated Newton methods, whereas the sequential linear um, uh, programming methods are derivative free uh, and they tend to be more robust to the order of computations. So the number of iterations that you require um, is, is a little bit more standard or stable. And that's an important consideration when you have an iterative algorithm is, is sensitivity to, to rattle fairer and how that affects the convergence path. I think that's something that's often um, forgotten about when we're talking about parallel computing, is that randall fairer can really affect the performance of the algorithm as well. Okay, so, um, so what I've talked about with, just with example one um, is, you know, it's a fairly dumb error function, and I could have written it in a very nasty way. Um, you know, if I was just some sort of research coder um, who was doing this sort of, uh, um, you know, without really sort of thinking about how this could be useful in practice, I'm sort of hard coding my model, um, as you see here, here's my Heston um, for a cosine um, characteristic function. Um, kind of hard coded in my error function and then I pass that to my optimizer and off I go. The problem with that is that, um, you know, there's this, some, this sort of horrible feeling creeping in that, you know, I'm, the domains of concerns are not being separated. The, the part that the quant cares about and wants to change is kind of buried in the, inside the error function and it's buried in sort of code that maps to the architecture and if that changes then, you know, um, so what I want to do is go back to the pattern approach and see if I can actually now, now I've got this implementation, uh, structure it in a better way that I've separated the domains of concern. So a quant just cares about passing in the model to the error function and someone with, who, who's got some parallel programming expertise can then go and sort of, you know, work on um, actually sort of doing the mapping, if you like, or the structural pattern. So you'll start to see the computational pattern and structural pattern emerge. Um, and in fact, let's discuss that now. So overall, there is one outer dynamic program, which is a computational pattern. This is my nonlinear solver. It could be, you know, a Newton's method. It could be, you know, any kind of iterative method. That's a computational pattern in itself. Inside that is, um, is, is, is a structural pattern. That's, you know, that is the fact that this co my, my, my solver itself is iterative. That in itself is a structural pattern. I, I may want to persist data on my host memory, for example. Um, I'll get to that later on if you're using a GPU. Then I have the, the problem of um, actually um, mapping all the option computations to the various cores or processes. And that's um, a structural pattern, um, it's a map and reduce. And you know, and we already saw that by setting up the pool and then we did this, essentially a scatter and a gather um, and using a reduction operation. Once we get inside the stochastic volatility model, um, we then have to solve um, you know, we then have to solve using some kind of spectral method. And inside the spectral method is another structural pattern again. There's, there's multiple levels of, of, of parallelism. Not just on the outer loop, which is over the, uh, which is over the convergence. Um, well, the, well, the outer loop is not, is not parallelizable, right? The, the iterations are, are dependent and task dependent. But once I parallelize the option chain, it, those options can be priced independent in the calibration. But within, this, there's a series expansion of the spectral method, and I can compute each characteristic function in the series in parallel. So there's task and there's data parallelism inherent in this, and I've just sort of represented this in this, in this, in this kind of crude schematic here. Um, for those of you who we sort of prefer to see things in terms of code, um, you know, all I'm doing here is defining an error function, um, and then there's my, I, I know I've done it here as sort of as, as an I and a J, but there's, there's really just one loop over the entire option chain and then within inside the Heston cosine function, which is my characteristic function, there is a series expansion as well, which I can parallelize. And you're going to see in example two that for the GPU, I'm going to need to take advantage of both, because there aren't enough levels of parallelism in the option, um, in, in the option chain, to exploit all the cores um, of the GPU. So I have to sort of dig inside, and hopefully, what's sort of appearing or in your mind is, is I'm talking is that. You know, this isn't just sort of farming out a computation as a magic bullet and hoping that you know something accelerated and, and comes back faster. There is a level of thinking that is required, and I think that that thinking can be framed through design patterns. So here, 
all there is is a structural pattern, which is just essentially a map of each of the Heston cosines to a particular node, and then I'm computing the sum of the results, and so that's the structural pattern here that, that um, is emerging in, in this very simple example. This is probably one of the most common examples you'll see all the time of the for loop. If you're using R, you would use things like do parallel, for example, do par. Uh, it's, you know, if you're using OpenMP, if any of you have used that before, you would have a you know a pragma, um, you know, a for loop uh, pragma statement in front of your, your your for loop. That's very standard and, and very common to see. But what's often sort of not done is to look inside the the kernel itself and to look. I'd say kernel, but I'd look inside the function itself and look for further opportunities for parallelism. Um, and and that's. Um, Something that uh, we didn't do here, but in, in example two, I'll show you that we did indeed go further than that. So, this is um, so in summary, we have a Python multi core CPU implementation on a cluster. Um, we used the for shared memory, uh, that's just using shared memory on each of the nodes. We use the multi processing package that gets around you know, um, the, the global interlock, which um, is sort of inherently single threaded. Um, and then we can um, uh, essentially use um, the, you know, send off MP processes um, to the, the multi-core CPU. Of course, we can't distribute computations across multiple nodes doing that um, shared memory implementation. So an alternative approach um, is to use the MPI for Pi package, which essentially is, is, is a very similar to uh, M, uh, OpenMP for Python. And all I've shown here in a very simple example is you could write the error function in a nasty way, or you could do something a little bit more intelligent, where you say, okay, what I'm gonna do is separate out the domains of concern, and depending on whether I have a cluster, or I have a multi-core cluster, or I have, um, or I want to do this, um, so one is, that's the shared memory implementation, or I want to have um, a cluster, a distributed memory computation, I just essentially try and change one, one line of code. So as a quant, all you're doing is you're separating out all the, the, the actual modeling part, so I can specify whatever model I want here in, in my function, and then I just send that to, to the MapReduce function. So I've separated out the computational pattern from the structural pattern. And uh, rather than having this cumbersome looking code which you saw a while back mm -hmm. here, where everything is sort of, inter, inter, sort of interwoven, all I've done now is pass the model that I'm interested in to a generic map uh, reduce function, and in this case, I, I specialized it for, a, for the multi-core implementation, so that's here, so I define a class uh, that does the, um, then I, I, all the details of the structural pattern implementation are here, so this is for the shared memory implementation on a multi-core processor, and then this is the, the distributed memory, so I've hidden that inside the structural patterns, so different structural patterns for different types of architectures or parallelisms. Um, and that's the key thing that, that um, I, you know, really sort of makes a point about parallelism here. And then as a quant, all I care about is then I can just work on my Hester model and I don't need to be concerned about all the low-level low, low, low level details of the structural pattern. So separating domains of concern um, was the objective here in this sort of prototype um, in, in example. So that, that's, that's sort of um, example one or lesson one. Um, having gone through the exercise, played around with it, seeing what's possible, what's, what, what, I, what I liked, what I didn't like about using Python. I haven't looked at, um, you know, obviously Continuum Analytics have many different um, Python accelerators now. Uh, you know, there's obviously Cython, um, and you know, there are a number of developments in Python, um, but, but none of them really sort of, I think, ultimately, you know, they all require decorators and um, they, at some level they require some kind of um, <clears throat> you know, sort of decoration of the code or addition of, of um, sort of unnecessary syntax which pollutes the code. Um, so I haven't, you know, Number Pro is one of them. Um, it, it, I mean, Travis Oliphant is uh, the author of Number. Um, I have much respect for um, and I think he's doing some excellent work in the area of Python. Uh, but I personally, I'm, I'm sort of, I think that the, the key is, is is you know to think about parallelism more from a, an architectural point of view, um, and then uh, decide on how to separate out the domains of concern. And so in the GPU example, I'm now going to switch over to using R, um, and uh, the parallel options in R are much more limited. Uh, when people say there's parallel computing capabilities in R, they're really only talking about embarrassingly parallel uh, problems. 
So there are a couple of packages. Um, there's GPU tools, which was developed by a bioinformatician at Stanford University, I believe, um, sort of while he was trying to solve some bioinformatics problems. Um, so it's a very nice clustering machine learning um, uh, uh, implementations for GPUs in the GPU tool package. There's been a lot of work by Dirk um, Ederbottle, who's based in Chicago. Um, he's also a quant trader and a good friend of mine. Um, and he continues to work on um, parallel pr programming packages uh, in R. And you know, I think um, I'm, I'm sort of very active in the R and finance movement. There's a uh, meeting every year in Chicago. Really great if you could come to that. There's one on May the 30th uh, in Chicago where everyone tries to present developments in the, the in sort of R infrastructure. And parallel computing is a, is a big one. But right now, R is, of course, inherently more single-threaded, no surprise. Um, and the worst thing about R is that um, the, the, the abstract syntax tree isn't modifiable. Um, in Python, you can modify the abstract syntax tree. Um, you can't do that in R. So unfortunately, one of the problems is um, it, it's a, you'd have to create your own version of R if you want to sort of release um, a, a more parallelizable version. And Revolution Analytics have tried to do this, but um, I, so far, I, I'm sort of, the jury's on the fence as far as I'm concerned, that Revolution Analytics have actually solved parallel computing problems. So R is, um, for the moment, um, I think R is, is a very interesting tool. Um, it's used a lot by, by the, the hedge, in, hedge fund industry. It's used a lot by economists and econometricians. Uh, I, I have to teach this. I'm, I'm forced to, to have to teach in R um, as well as Python, so I don't get a say in any of this. But I'm going to show you now um, how I took the same program and then accelerated it on the GPU. Uh, and so keep in mind that R is single-threaded. Um, the you know, there are things like Snow and Multicore and a couple of uh, parallel processing packages, but they're very limited in terms of the types of parallel uh, programming that they support. So when you go back to that um, diagram I showed you, all the different types of parallelism, um, very few of those computational kernels are supported in parallel. It's getting better, but really R is, is I think, has, is in a lot worse situation than Python as far as um, you know, parallel computing uh, capability. That said, um, you know, so we ran the code with six different single name equity um, options, found that you know, as usual, the error function dominates the, uh, the overall time. And the question is, how can I offload the error function onto a GPU in R? Um, I was kind of curious because everyone says, oh, R's got so much overhead, it's an interpreted language, you know, um, you know, why don't you just do this in C? Well, you know, R has a lot of nice high-level functions, and I have to do a lot more work in C to get the same R level of functionality. So, but I coded it up in C anyway, um, and we found that really, because there's the the, the the bottleneck itself, the characteristic function, is so compute intensive, there's very little overhead coming from R. I'll show you that in a moment. Um, so hold that thought. I will show you the numbers. Um, but you can see already that, you know, for example, the total time in milliseconds um, is around, sorry, in seconds um, is, uh, is, is 132 in C, um, and, it was, and it was around 441. So it's about a factor of three speed up just going into C and R, which isn't, you know, it's an enormous amount. Uh, personally, I, I wasn't that excited about it, um, but, but you know, many people have said to me, oh, C's, C's a factor of you know, 10x faster, and uh, I think that's a very uh, contextual statement. In this case, um, it really just depends on the workload, and you know, also we weren't using any code optimization, so I mean, uh, this is you know, a very sort of limited result. So then, if I've got R and I want to use the GPU, uh, what can I do? Well, I think if you know, you know, this is this is the problem. Um, you know, essentially, it's it's very difficult to do anything um, in, unless you write some CUDA and C, and then you're down into the, to exactly what I'm trying to avoid, which is burying all the modeling logic in another programming language. So what I'd like to do is be able to express my model in R, and then have this structural pattern be behind the scenes. And I don't want to have to code a Bates, a Bates model in CUDA. I don't want to have to code anything in CUDA that's model specific. So I tried to do this and find a way to do it. And um, uh, but what I found was, you know, uh, I don't want to use OpenCL as well because it's pretty ugly language as, as, as beautiful and, and as, uh, as the sort of initiative is. Um, it's really a horrible language to code in. Um, and, um, and I, I certainly don't want to use that. There are uh, bindings in R for OpenCL. There's even bindings for CUDA. Um, but what I'm going to do is just show you very quickly then, um, you know, how it works. And in the process, for those of you that haven't played around with GPUs, 
I'll say a little bit about the architecture and the threading model. So, uh, you know, a GPU is essentially designed for, for high um, scalability, for, for, for highly parallel uh, applications, very lightweight threads, um, uh, and is essentially, you know, the idea is to divide a monolithic thread array into multiple blocks, and then each block, um, you know, uh, the threads within each block cooperate by shared memory and supports atomic operations and barrier synchronization. Uh, but, but one of the major problems is, what we view it as a problem or a limitation is, or its programming model is that the, the threads in different blocks can't really cooperate. Um, so you really have to design the application so that um, the, the, there's somewhat of a self-contained computation within each of the blocks. So you get to choose how many blocks there are, uh, you can choose how many threads there are in each block, up to a, a limitation on the on the architecture, which changes with each generation of architecture. And then, of course, you know, as you all know by now, uh, the killer with any kind of offloading model in programming is you've got host memory and you've got device memory, um, and you really want to be minimizing the amount of movement of of data between uh, the host and device memory via a PCIe bus. Um, you know, for PCIe 2, um, it's around about 6 uh, gigabytes per second bandwidth. For PCIe 3, I think it's around about 50 gigabytes per second. But it's still um, a, a major limitation. Um, and certainly for sort of big data applications where you're streaming high frequency data, um, it's not, not a good application unless the amount of work that you've got to do dominates against communication. So it's Amdahl's law, you must have very high amount of, of computation to communication in order for the parallelism to be scalable. So in this application, I'm fortunate, and I don't have very much data to copy onto the, to, to onto the device. Moreover, that data can then just sit there at each iteration, and I don't need to keep transferring data backwards and forwards um, in, in arrays or, or even matrices backwards and forwards between the device and the host. If I have to do that, then my, my performance is going to really be penalized, even with streaming, um, uh, uh, um, and it, which is supported in in, in CUDA 6 onwards, and you know, even though CUDA's done, you know, they've done a great job of, of trying to hide or uh, make it much more easy to program uh, by automating a lot of this memory movement prior to CUDA 6. You had to do a lot of the, this manually. Um, now it's being automated, but essentially it's really um, um, a very, it's very problematic, and I think a lot of people uh, got sort of very heavily burnt. Um, a colleague of mine teaches uh, parallel computing, and he said almost every student in his class set out to do a matrix matrix computation on GPU as an exercise, and they found it was slower than the serial implementation. Um, so they weren't, you know, they're, it's not an easy thing to get uh, speed up uh, on a GPU when there's a lot of memory that needs to be moved around. And what I want to show here is that, um, uh, and this, you know, I'm, I'm using Tesla generation architecture. I use a K20 here. I use a K40 um, later on in the third example. There's three examples I want to show you. So the first one, of course, was in Python and MPI on a cluster. We're now doing GPUs um, and showing you how to offload from R onto GPU use, and using CUDA. And again, the whole idea is to identify the parallelism, the building blocks, the computational patterns, the structural patterns. I'm going to map, that, map the Hester model computation onto blocks of GPUs, uh, uh, I'm sorry, onto blocks of threads. And so the chain size, that's the number of options in the chain, uh, determines the number of blocks that I'm going to, to, to have um, on. And then each thread block computes the option price. So essentially, the number of threads in the blocks is, is determined by how many um, series, I, how many terms in the series I want for that characteristic function uh, series expansion. Uh, and then uh, the number of, yeah, as I just said, the number of threads. So, and then I want to aggregate the result um, and then return that to the CPU, um, and then ultimately back to R. So here's conceptually the, the, what the model looks like. So that's each option is assigned to a block. Um, and so here's my Hester model, my Bates model, and then each thread uh, computes one term, one characteristic function evaluation in the series expansion of that, of that integral that you saw in the European option pricing uh, formula. And then the res result is stored in shared memory, um, and then um, essentially using a parallel reduction tree, uh, you can in log n, um, n is, here is 8, but in, in log to base 2n, you can then um, return the aggregated result at, at each uh, within each thread block. So each thread member is communicating with um, within the shared memory, uh, and it can't communicate with other threads uh, outside that thread block. And so the the algorithm is, is that's just the algorithm for the uh, re parallel reduction tree, the, bin the binary, the, yeah, 
the, with a the log uh, 2n uh, complexity. And then I finally, so this is my function here, uh, whatever that is, a Heston model or a Bates model. And I have to set up my, uh, my thread in index, my block index. I have to set the block dimension. I have to, um, and then I will eventually compute what the option price is. Um, and then that gets returned. Uh, <clears throat> and so all I do then for in R is I wrap um, a, a, a DLL, or a, I did this on Linux, so I created a, a dynamic library, um, and then I, I uh, essentially just dynamically load the, the library into memory, uh, and then I just call my error function, uh, and I'll show you the more details of the R implementation. But, um, you know, so I created a CRAN library, um, and I'll, right now it's, it's alpha version, so I, I'll give you the GitHub repository if you're interested. These are standard libraries that you get in, in R. This is for the differential evolution. This is for the nonlinear optimization. I then write a function called load chain, which copies the data from the host to the device memory. Um, and then, oh, oh, sorry, loads, sorry, loads the chain from the file, copy data, excuse me, uh, copies the data across. And then I set which model I'm interested in. So I might use a variance gamma or CGMY or Heston. Um, I set my block size. Hard code that so that's the that's the number of terms in the um, in the series expansion that I that I want, and then all I do is pass my error function, having of course um, uh, you know the caveat that I had uh, the error function itself then wrap um, this uh, this call to the to the a C CUDA uh, implementation. So I had to offload into a CUDA environment, and that's how I did it. And there's it's pretty easy to build up the the. The, the, the SO file, if you go uh, and look on CRAN and how to create a CRAN repository, it's, it's pretty easy to do that. Um, so here's what I, okay, well I'll show you some results and then I'll, I'll sort of give my running commentary on, on you know, why, why I, I sort of, what was learned from this. Um, but essentially, going from R to, to offloading to the GPU sped my calculation up by over a thousand. And I had several thousands of cores here, I had 2,496 cores. Um, it's a factor of three reduction if I'm going from C, just from comparison. But overall, um, because the parallel efficiency is, is so high, you know, there's very little difference between the C GPU version and the R GPU version once you've efficiently offloaded onto the GPU. I say efficiently because to really um, map the computation um, to the architecture requires a lot of thinking and also exploit the parallelism. Um, I had to really exploit two levels of parallelism here. I had to exploit both the number of options and the number of thread blocks. So that's my chain. I had to mark each option onto the onto the thread block. And then within each thread block, I need to keep each thread busy doing something. So I had to feed it a pretty, you know, a pretty compute intensive <coughs> um, characteristic function. And fortunately, um, GPUs are very efficient at handling transcendental functions. There's a lot of transcendental functions inside the characteristic function because it's using complex, um, uh, complex uh, arithmetic. So, you know, things work pretty well here, but, you know, I'm left with this nagging feeling at the end of it, having done it, um, and by the way, that's, you can download it from, um, if you just type library dev tools, uh, install GitHub, GPU calibration, username that, um, then you can run this code uh, and, and play around with it. And all the details are in the paper we published in the R and Finance conference last year. <coughs> um, and um, and so, <clears throat> so the summary so far is that, well, what, what was the problem here? What did we sort of, if you go back to the, the pattern approach for a second, <coughs> why is offloading in this way uh, a bad idea? What are the pros and cons? Well, we got really good speed up. You know, I mean, a, a factor of a thousand is pretty good. So, um, you know, the overall computation time is, is significantly reduced um, by doing this. Um, and, um, and so, you know, it makes suddenly R very compute, um, you know, very, what would have been computationally prohibitive in R becomes very, very, um, very possible. But the problem is, is that I had to code the Heston model and the Bates model and all those different models in CUDA as well. I couldn't find a way of passing, uh, I couldn't write the code in R and then somehow pass that to CUDA and have it translate or something like that and generate um, um, you know, the uh, efficient code for deployment on the CUDA, uh, sorry, on the, on the GPU. So the, I'm left with a problem that I have not separated my domains of concern. The financial modeling code has got buried with the, with, the, with the actual CUDA mapping code, which again just seems to me like the sort of the wrong way to, to do things. So 
Um, so yes, offloading onto GPU, uh, in principle, a great thing. It, it can get you sort of out of a, a out of a, a sort of a rat hole, so to speak. Um, it's very easy to create these packages, um, and uh, and it's obviously a lot of people who are doing are uh, run into compute bound kind of problems. Uh, but then the problem is that you really cannot avoid having to, to move into a low level environment at some point. And so um, you know, for me, I, I had sort of mixed I had reservations about this. And that really sets us up, and that's a segue for uh, example three, which is having gone through the pain of figuring out, well, how do I separate out my model from, from the mapping itself, and how do I avoid having to code up my model in CUDA? We worked with Accelerate, took the same case study, and this time we worked in C++, and we wrote one C++ code and then deployed that on, on multi-core CPU and also on the GPU. We didn't have to write multiple versions of the code. We didn't have to, um, as you'll see in a moment, um, do anything that was that difficult. Um, it took me a couple of days um, just sort of playing around with, a, with our API um, to do this. And the, the principal idea behind Accelerate is to use um, a directed acyclic graph to represent um, the, the algorithm, the, essentially the parallelism. You express the, the sources of parallelism through what's called a source uh, actor. In this case, um, the option index, which is the data parallelism, and the term index which is where there's, um, there is, um, well, sorry, the, 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 that's, that's the data parallelism, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, sorry, no, Fourier term. Um, so data parallelism and task parallelism. I've expressed both levels of parallelism there, so all the terms I need for expanding the Fourier cosine series are given as an index over J, and all the options in the chain are over I. So I've, I have expressed all the sources of parallelism when I set up the sync. <coughs> then there are intermediary actor nodes, and one can very easily build up, um, you know, polymorphism to um, to, to have uh, essentially different, you know, implementations of stochastic, different stochastic volatility models. So here, for example, um, I have uh, uh, a, an abstract class um, which is derived from um, from an actor, um, and then I will uh, then I will derive from that into various different uh, types of models. So I have a stochastic model. I'd have a Bates model, I'd have a Hester model, etc. I'll show you the code in a moment. And then I, I call a partial um, reduction to sum up all the Fourier series, and then finally have a sync node which returns the scalar result. So this is the accelerate processing graph, and we need to figure out is essentially how your computation um, can be expressed in this way. So this is their, their programming model uh, or their processing graph. And the details are, you know, you can go on their website and look, they have a paper. Uh, in, in, in the supercomputing conference I, I mentioned, um, which details the, uh, uh, the, the graph itself and how that, that works. Um, this didn't come out too well, this slide, so I apologize um, for that. Um, <clears throat> but essentially, you know, on the left, uh, and I'll share the slides with you so that uh, this is actually readable, but on the left was the, the original sequential version of a, of a Heston um, <clears throat> Uh, essentially a Heston uh, computation. And on the right is how to express the, or how to implement the, uh, it, with the Accelerate API. And so I derived my Fourier cosine class from, the, from this actor class. And the actor class is essentially an interface, and I'm forced to implement uh, uh, essentially a run function. Um, and inside that I placed the, the code itself um, for so I, I've now derived again from my Fourier cosine class, I have my Heston class, and then I, I put the, the code itself in C++. I don't need to write any CUDA here. Um, and so I can now derive classes from, for my different stochastic models, <coughs> which is great. I've separated out my domains of concern. And then all I need to do is um, use certain uh, keywords here in front of my function, just the actor. Um, and and there's really very little in terms of any parallel programming primitives um, or any decorators uh, other than, than, than the actor keyword. And, and so the hard part, I think, is just you know, conceptually being able to identify where your sources of parallelism are and set up your source nodes. Um, and then from there, you can uh, very quickly build up um, some code and just quickly cut and paste your, your existing legacy code into, into a class. Um, and what we found was that, um, so we were expecting more overhead from setting up the graph, and that's certainly true. So if you compare our native CUDA implementation, this is before we worked with Accelerate, this is the best CUDA implementation we could get. That was example two, no R, just using the C++. 
Um, and we found that, yeah, for, for smaller workloads with a small number of Fourier series terms, um, you know, it, it, a native version beat the, the accelerate version by a fairly small amount. But once you start increasing the resolution, um, reducing the error in the Fourier series um, expansion of the estimate, it's up to there, 4,096 terms. Um, we found that the accelerate GPU is actually faster than our, our native implementation. Um, and the great thing is, you know, I could take uh, the same code, run it on the CPU, or compile it with, with a CPU flag, or compile it with a GPU flag, and I didn't have to keep around multiple versions of the code, which is sort of hits the, the portability um, sort of uh, check. Uh, and it's also flexible in the sense that I, I can keep my modeling code separate from the, the actual mapping of the computation. So I don't have to sort of get my actual implementation of my Hester model is not architecture specific, as it was in example two, and um, it sort of was in, well, in example one, I managed to separate those out eventually. So it's good to have architecture independent implementations of our models. So we don't have to keep re-implementing them, and thus having buggy code, etc., cetera, um, multiple versions of codes. And so the lessons learned here are really that, um, you know, to the extent that we can um, write one code and have that efficiently deployed in different architectures, 